Hey guys, welcome back to Intelligent Faith 315. My name is Pastor Jay. I run the website here. Uh, I'm glad that you've joined us today. Uh, I'm happy if you're a Christian and you're coming here to Intelligent Faith to uh, continue to build yourself up and be obedient to the command that we find in Scripture to always be ready to have an answer when anybody asks you to give a reason for the hope that lies within you, 1 Peter 3.15. If you're a Christian, I'm glad you're here. But I'm especially glad that you're here. If you are a non-Christian, if you're an atheist, an agnostic, uh, a seeker, uh, just somebody that's curious perhaps as to does it even make sense to believe in Christianity? Is there any good evidence that exists uh, to believe in such a being as God? Is the Christian faith, the Christian worldview, is it nonsense? Or is it perhaps um, cohesive and coherent? Is it logical and, and reasonable? So I'm glad that you're here, uh, whichever side of the coin that you happen to find yourself on. And today we're going to be continuing on in our series, Good Arguments for God's Existence. Now, if you've been with us as we've come up this far, uh, today we find ourselves in the Kalam cosmological argument. We've already covered um, the cosmological argument from contingency, which was popularized by the German mathematician and philosopher uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz in the 1700s. So do encourage you to scroll down and check out that video and those postings on the right side of the website. Just scroll down. Um, and you can catch those articles. You can do some uh, internet research on your own. You can get some really good books on that. Reason Faith by Dr. William Lane Craig is a great place to start. And today, as I said, we are going to be continuing on uh, with the third installment of the Kalam cosmological argument. Before we do that, let me just um, share a couple of things with you guys as you're tuning in to Intelligent Faith 315. I do encourage you to uh, follow us on Twitter if you're into that, if you know how to tweet and stuff. And if you follow Twitter regularly, do encourage you um, to click on Intelligent Faith 315, follow us, like us, and you're going to get the uh, article post titles sent uh, to your account every day. You can pass those on. I uh, encourage you just to, to pass them on to two or three folks every time you get them, just to kind of spread abroad the news and the work uh, that we're trying to do here at Intelligence and Faith 315. So you can follow us that way. You can follow us by subscribing to the RSS feed. Uh, you can follow us uh, on, on the Google uh, subscription uh, tab that's also on the right side of the website. Or you can just type your email in that little box the old-fashioned way, and you can subscribe to us and get the articles and post them directly into your email. So do encourage you to follow us. Um, you can compile a database, kind of your own personal library of study material that we're putting out, videos, articles, links, and so forth. It's good for your own personal study, but then I think it's also good to have some information to be able to pass on to your friends, fellow students. Um, you guys can use it to generate discussion, maybe get a little study group going on your campus. Um, it's, it's good information to really try to help you guys and equip you uh, to earnestly contend for the faith and to help people understand that Christianity, the Christian worldview, philosophy, the Christian faith is reasonable and it's rational. And then, of course, when the Lord impacts your life, well, then it becomes radical. So just do want to help you guys out. I encourage you to subscribe and get the information sent into your account. And also, before I uh, get into our argument for today, I just want to give a shout out to two really, really interesting um, on-campus student ministries that I've become aware of. One of them is called Ratio Christi. Uh, this is headed up by uh, a man that I, I really respect. His name is Blake Anderson. Uh, Ratio Christi, of course, is a Latin expression. R-A-T-I-O uh, Christi, C-H-R-I-S-T-I. And I believe the website is ratiochristi.org. But uh, Blake has a, a blog going on. They've got a website. Um, and any of you guys that are interested in Christian apologetics, what Ratio Christi is doing, and they're being supported and even funded by some really, really good organizations and Christian apologists, what they're trying to do is over the next couple of years to place a Christian apologist at every university in America. And so for those of you who, who do have apologetic training or are in the process, like myself, of acquiring more apologetic training, perhaps in your master's or your Ph.D. or something like that, you might want to prayerfully consider contacting Ratio Christi and contacting Blake. Just tell them that Pastor Jay sent you. <laughs> Just joking. And uh, what they want to do is try to place trained apologists um, or apologists in training at these different universities, and they're looking for men and women to head up individual chapters of Ratio Christi. 
and um, they want to help support you financially and then they'll also show you how to generate your own support but it can turn into uh, your your life's calling um, and really just your your mission so I do encourage you to check out Ratio Christi headed up by Blake Anderson and some other great guys uh, give them a shout out uh, send them an email pray for them great organization and also another really really interesting student ministry that I've come across recently is a group called Christian Union now, these people are very like-minded, for example, with uh, Ratio Christi, with Intelligent Faith. They really want to penetrate the academic culture and the academic environment and to give an intelligent, articulate voice to the Christian worldview and faith. But the interesting thing about the Christian Union, and their website is christian-union.org, the interesting thing about the Christian Union, which was established in 2002, is that their specific focus is on the Ivy League schools. In other words, um, the eight Ivy League schools that exist in America, and they produce some of the most influential leaders of our nation. For example, did you know that six out of our last ten presidents have come from the Ivy League schools? Over half of the leaders of our nation graduate from these eight universities uh, out of the over 2,300 other universities in America. And so Christian Union specific focus is on these eight Ivy League campuses. So it's a very interesting, you know, unique mission and vision that the Lord has given them. So I encourage you to pray for them. I encourage you to uh, prayerfully consider, you know, if you want to give to them, uh, uphold them, send them an email, and just check them out. Go to christian-union.org. I think it's a great ministry uh, that they're really doing. So um, do encourage you to, to look into Christian Union and into Ratio Christi. All right, well, let's get into our argument for today. Again, we're going to be continuing on and hopefully finishing up the Kalam cosmological argument for God's existence. I talk a lot, so i got to keep my throat dry. Um, as we said when we've begun this, this video series, Good Arguments for God's Existence, a couple of weeks ago, the cosmological argument, um, this is really a family of different arguments um, that seek to demonstrate God's existence uh, by contemplating and examining certain universal truths that we hold regarding the universe. For example, um, let's see, everything that exists has an explanation for its existence. Okay, Everything that exists has an explanation for its existence. That is a, that is a general universal principle that we hold to be true about, about the cosmos, about the universe. And then... Um, we then use that truth and we reason back to uh, the existence of God logically and rationally. So that's the Leibnizian cosmological argument. That's how that starts off in the first premise. But the Kalam cosmological argument, rather than talking about um, a sufficient explanation or a sufficient reason, as did Leibniz in his argument, the Kalam cosmological argument, it focuses on a first cause for the universe. So the Kalam cosmological argument, um, it's called Kalam based upon medieval Islamic theologians that really popularized it. They're not the only ones. Uh, St. Bonaventure and some Jewish theologians also uh, popularized this version of the Kalam cosmological argument. But it, it's, it's very well known uh, from Islamic medieval theologians like Al-Ghazali from the 1100s and so forth. Today, Dr. William Lane Craig from um, Talbot Theological Seminary at Biola University um, he's probably by far the most outspoken advocate and proponent of this cosmological argument. And this argument goes like this. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Let me go over that again because it's incredibly short and deceptively simple. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Now again, I just want to remind you, this is the power and I believe the benefit of natural theology. These philosophical arguments that can lead us powerfully and persuasively to the existence of God. They're very short, they're very succinct, they're easy to memorize. And when you're talking with someone who does not accept the authority or the truth claim of the Bible yet... But yet they do accept logic, philosophy, and clear thinking and reason. And so appealing to natural theology, which scripture tells us to do, is a great way to begin a conversation and a great way to begin to engage people and point them to the existence of God and to uh, the truth of the person of Christ. So, as we talked about last time, that first premise, everything that begins to exist has a cause, 
is a reasonable, plausible premise. The law of causality, our common everyday experience, uh, and even the scientific method all rest upon the truth of that first general or universal premise. So we're within our, our rational or epistemic rights of accepting premise one. It seems to make sense. This is the common perception of the everyday man. Uh, the only other alternative to premise one would be to say that uh, things can come into to being, things can begin to exist uncaused. And surely, once we start down that line of thinking, it quickly becomes nonsensical and incoherent. So we're within our rights to uh, accept the truth of premise one. It doesn't violate any laws of logic. It's plausible, and it seems correct. So we can then go to premise number two. Now, what was premise number two? Well, premise number one was everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise number two, the universe began to exist. Now, we talked about in our last video how in the 1100s, in the days of Al-Ghazali, for example, this uh, medieval Islamic theologian, or earlier than that, St. Bonaventure, for example, who also used this cosmological argument, before they had access to quote-unquote modern science, which is what we're going to talk about today, they demonstrated the, the truth of that second premise by appealing to philosophy. Today, we're going to appeal to science to demonstrate powerfully and persuasively, and I think conclusively, five ways which we know scientifically that second premise is true. But as we discussed last time, the two philosophical ways in which we can demonstrate that the universe had a cause is in the following. Number one, we know that it is philosophically impossible to cross an infinite distance. And number two, we know that it's impossible for an actual infinite to exist, an actual infinite set of things to exist. So, uh, in other words, if the universe were actually infinite, we never would have arrived at our present day, but yet we have. So I do encourage you to examine that last video, and philosophically, those are two you know, indisputable reasons, very strong philosophical reasons why we're within our rights, just philosophically, even without science, but we're within our rights for accepting that truth of premise two because we know that philosophically, number one, it is impossible to cross an infinite distance. And number two, it is impossible for an actual infinite set to exist, an actual infinite number of things to exist. Potential infinites can exist, a potential infinite, but do not confuse that with an actual infinite um set of things that increases by successive addition of one more item. So by those two philosophical reasons, the impossibility of an actual infinite existing and the impossibility of crossing an actual infinite distance, we know that the universe uh, has not been here for an infinite amount of time, rather a finite amount of time, and the universe indeed had a beginning uh, a finite time ago. So philosophically, we're within our rights to accept the truth of premise two. What about science? Now let me just pause and say something right here. It's incredibly vital for us as Christians to not be afraid of science. Science is the ally of the Christian. Let me share with you a couple of things. Many Christians think that science has somehow made belief in God obsolete or unreasonable. This is absolutely not true. About 95% of science has little or nothing to do at all with what we hold to be true theologically and philosophically about God. For example, uh, the uh, atomic structure of a methane molecule has absolutely nothing to do with, with belief in God, whether that's rational or not. Um, so let's say the 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 combust the let's see um i'm trying to think of some other things here the chemical reaction and acid base reaction um the combustibility or the explosive reactions that take place uh, within a g2 dwarf star like our sun happens to be in the center of the um, solar system. I mean, there's so many facts of science that are well established, but 95% of these facts have little or nothing to do with the Christian faith. And so do not be afraid of science. Um, most of it has nothing to do with it. The 5% that does intersect with Christianity, a huge amount of that, as we'll see today, uh, does have uh, supportive conclusions for the Christian worldview. So rather than it being your nemesis or your foe or your enemy, it's rather the, the ally of the Christian. Let me add another thing here. Um, 
the philosophical statement, or I should say the statement that only those things that can be demonstrated scientifically, in other words, through the language of physics and chemistry, only things that can be demonstrated in those ways or measured empirically in the language of physics or chemistry can be accepted with any legitimate truth value. That statement is self-contradictory. It's self-defeating. Why? Because the truth of that statement itself cannot be measured or evaluated with the language of physics or chemistry. So that's a philosophical statement. It's basically scientism. And this is a philosophical viewpoint that's really taking hold in the universities today, that if I can't see it, taste it, touch it, weigh it, or in other words, express it in the language somehow of physics and chemistry, then it doesn't really tell me anything in truth about reality. But that own statement fails to meet its own criteria. So that's what we call self-stultifying, self-contradicting, self-defeating. Um, it just comes back and defeats itself. So those are some things to keep in mind about science. Scientism is becoming a philosophy today that really is self-defeating. 95% of science has nothing to do with the Christian claims, the, the, the Christian worldview truth claims. The 5% of science uh, that does intersect is tremendously supportive of the Christian worldview. And also, let me just share this with you. A, a, a large majority of the founders of the modern scientific movement were Christian men and women. Men like Max uh, Michael, Michael Faraday, James Clark Maxwell, um, or certainly if they were not Christians, they were theists like Albert Einstein. Well, he was actually a deist, but a, a believer in God. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, um, Louis Pasteur, uh, Johannes Kepler, um, Gregory Mendel, the father of modern genetics. Louis Pasteur is the, mo the, the father of uh, modern bacteriology. James Clark Maxwell, uh, Michael Faraday, electromagnetism. Um, Samuel Morse, um, Robert Boyle, his gas laws. So many of the founding fathers of the modern scientific movement were God believers, a huge number of them, born again biblical Christians. And it was out of a, 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 Christian, a Christian culture, a Christian cultural context in which the scientific revolution began. Because you see, from a Christian worldview and framework, we expect to find order and design and, and logical results as we uh, set our instruments and, and we set our gaze upon the cosmos and universe to understand it. We expect to find ordered results because we live in an ordered universe because it has an intelligent mind and designer behind it. So keep that uh, in your back pocket intellectually, so to say, because... Uh, the majority of the founders of the modern scientific movement from which we are still reaping the benefits and, and gaining momentum for, the vast majority of them were God believers um, and or just straight up Christians. And so faith and science are not um, contradictory, rather they're complementary. 95% of science has nothing to do with Christianity. The 5% of that science that does is tremendously supportive of the conclusions of the Christian worldview and the claim that only statements that can be ver verified through scientific language have any real truth value um, fails to meet its own criteria because it cannot itself be tested by science. So keep those things in mind. So let's continue now that I've talked so much. I apologize. So we're still in that second premise, the universe had a beginning. We've demonstrated two ways that that premise can be and should be accepted, right? It is impossible to cross an infinite distance, and it's impossible for an actual infinite number of things to exist. But what about scientifically? Now, again, this is tremendous evidence to have in your back pocket intellectually. Why? So that when you begin to talk with somebody, you can help them understand that if the Christian worldview is actually true, if the Christian faith, if the Christian philosophy, if the Christian way of perceiving and looking at reality is really true, then it's not going to contradict science, real, actual, genuine science. And we should actually be able to look out into the world around us, and we should be able to um, recognize certain features of the universe, the cosmos of reality, that correspond or match up with what we would expect to be true in the Christian worldview. And this is actually what we find. And so uh, this is tremendously helpful to the Christian. It's actually tremendously damaging to the atheist, to the agnostic, uh, to a pantheist, a polytheist, um, because a lot of those 
ways of looking at reality or worldviews are incompatible with what we do discover in the world around us, especially scientifically. Not so for the Christian. And so again, this just, uh, how should I say, adds to the scales in our favor intellectually and evidentially because scientifically speaking, um, there is so much evidence and proof within the corner of the biblical Christian. So let's just get into this. There's at least five ways, guys, I'd like to share with you quickly, five ways in which modern scientific discoveries about physics, astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology have helped Christians uh, really just be in such a strong position scientifically. Five major discoveries um, from 1916 till up about to now that we're just in an incredibly strong intellectual position, and, and we're rationally justified scientifically to believe um, that there is a cause behind the universe. Five pieces, five different lines of scientific evidence. So if you remember the word fresh, F-R-E-S-H, you can remember these five different lines of scientific evidence. Uh, I put it in an acronym form because... I'm a teacher, and so acronyms and systematic memory devices is kind of the way that I think. It makes it easier for me to remember. Hopefully, it'll make it easier for you to remember. And hopefully, with this acronym FRESH, it can give you, and hopefully your friends, a fresh perspective about the universe, maybe, uh, that it had a cause behind it uh, in its beginning. So, uh, FRESH. This stands for, the F, first of all, stands for famous equation. Okay, what is the famous equation? Well, in 1916... Interesting German uh, scientist working in a Swiss patent office, Albert Einstein, uh, with the crazy white hairdo that all came later that we all know about, fascinated by the, uh, the behavior and the properties of light itself and so forth, he came up with this equation, E equals mc squared. What does that mean? Well, of course, I'm sure most of you know, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. The C is for celeritas. Uh, I believe it's Latin for for quick or, or, or rapid. So 1916 equals mc squared by Albert Einstein. So there's many implications to his theory, but one of them is what? That all time, space, matter, and energy had a definite beginning a finite time ago. Now initially, if you do some research, um, and there's probably uh, three or four interpretations of his theory, uh, Albert Einstein did not like this initial conclusion that it did appear mathematically that the universe had a definite point of beginning a finite time ago. And so he introduced uh, some mathematical creativity there, so to say, and he kind of fudged his results, which later on I believe he referred to that as the biggest mistake of his career. But it eventually became known and accepted that uh, E equals MC squared, this theory from Albert Einstein regarding relativity, powerfully and persuasively points to the beginning of our, our time and space uh, reality a finite time ago. Now, what happened is that um, Newtonian physics were replaced by relativity in, in this sense, in the sense that um, Albert Einstein's equation became the scientific foundation upon which a huge body of modern physics is actually practiced today. And so, again, if people are going to be consistent in the way that they uh, look at mathematics and reality and so forth, it's interesting to remind them of this fact that not only did the man behind the theory himself believe in God, Albert Einstein believed in a deistic guy, did not believe in the God of Scripture, a theistic God, a personal creator, but rather he believed in a deistic God, which that is in and of itself is very telling. One of the brightest minds and most famous intellectual mathematicians that ever lived believed in a deistic God, but also his theory, which has changed the course of modern mathematics and physics and really uh, the, the enterprise of science itself, points to the fact that our universe had a beginning, a finite time ago from nothing. So remember the famous equation, that's what the F is for. The R in fresh is for ripples of heat, ripples of heat. Well, what is that? Well, 
again, well, actually, no, let me just let me just hold off for a second. Let me back check real quick to the famous equation. And of course, remember, you might be um, used to the fact today in 2012 that it makes sense for us to believe that there was a beginning of the universe, but not so in Einstein's day, not so even a couple of decades ago, because it was just simply believed that the universe was static, the universe was eternal, it's always been here, always will be here. As Carl Sagan, uh, the, the atheistic cosmologist, used to say, um, the universe is all there is, there ain't no more. So, and then, of course, if you go back to ancient Greek materialism, and, and, and as far back as you can remember, um, an eternal universe, a static universe, was really uh, a hallmark of many world religions and philosophical ideas and scientific theories. Until, as I said, E equals MC squared and Einstein's theory of relativity was brought out, this is all shattered. Uh, out of this has come the cosmological model for the universe, which is known as the Big Bang Theory. And for 80 years now, I believe, the, the Big Bang Theory, which originally that was a derisive comment, um, has withstood dozens of assaults scientifically trying to deflate it and replace it because scientists, many of them, are trying to escape the conclusions of having a universe with a beginning. But the Big Bang model does seem to be scientifically uh, the strongest model that there is for the cosmos. And interestingly enough, um, this idea of the universe coming into, coming into being out of nothingness a, a finite time ago in the past lines up with what the first verse, of course, of Scripture has always taught us, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or, if you even go to John chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything was made through Him, and there was not anything that was made that was not made through Him, through this Word. He created all things. All things were created by Him and for him. And so this idea of the universe being created out of nothing a finite time ago by an all-powerful cause, it seems to be indicated through uh, this theory of relativity from Albert Einstein. So that's the famous equation, the F in the acronym FRESH. The R, as I began to get into, is for ripples of heat. R is for the ripples of heat. So according to the Big Bang model of the universe, if that theory was true, um, certain other things were expected to be discovered. One of them were these, these giant ripples of heat and matter strewn throughout the galaxy, which would allow for the conditions to be such that, that galaxies and uh, solar systems could form in the proper way. So this was one of the predictions of the Big Bang model. These ripples of heat and matter spread throughout the universe in a precisely finely tuned fashion. For this very reason, in 1989, NASA launches the COBE satellite, C-O-B-E, which stood for Cosmic Background Explorer, $200 million satellite, uh, launched it up into outer space. And in 1992, they got back the results. And um, George Smoot, he was a, I think he was a cosmologist from, uh, let me just, just, just read here. Uh, this is some text from a, a book that I'm working on, actually. Uh, when the COBE findings were announced in 1992 by the project leader, astronomer George Smoot, it was another startling scientific confirmation of the divine creation event spoken of in Scripture. Smoot said, quote, If you're religious, it's like looking at God. Another physicist, Michael Turner, was asked from the University of Chicago, and he, and he said the significance of that discovery could not be overstated. He said this, they have found the holy grail of cosmology. And even the world's famous, the world's most famous astronomer Stephen Hawking from Cambridge called the COBE findings the most important discovery of this century, if not of all time. The interesting thing that they did discover was not just that the predictions of the Big Bang model, which was a model that predicted the universe to come out of nothingness, only a finite time ago, not just that the predictions themselves were shown to be true, but that the, the level of fine-tuning of precise, uh, detailed engineering that they discovered within these ripples of heat, it was finely tuned um, to one part in a hundred thousand. And astronomer George Smoot even called these things, these ripples of heat, the machining marks from the creation of the universe and the fingerprints of the maker himself. So again, I do encourage you to do some investigation into the COBE uh, satellite, $200 million launched in 1989, and these ripples of heat and matter fine-tuned down to one part of, in 
one part in 100,000 right in line with the Big Bang model. Again, it's, it's, it's another layer of additional scientific proof of uh, the universe beginning out of, out of nothingness a finite time ago in support of that second premise, the universe had a beginning. So F in fresh is for the famous equation, E equals MC squared. The R is for the ripples of heat. The E is for the expansion of the universe. Now, most of you are familiar with a man named Edwin Hubble. If you don't recognize his first name, I'm sure you recognize his last name because Hubble, of course, is the name of the deep space uh, telescope that we have today. The Hubble Deep Space Telescope is named after famous astronomer Edwin Hubble. Why is he famous? Because in 1929, at the Mount Wilson Observatory, um, the astronomer Edwin Hubble, through tremendous long hours of hard work and calculations, he noticed something very peculiar. He noticed that the light from distant galaxies as it arrived to Earth was red-shifted. And after his observations and calculations, he discovered that, in fact, the universe was itself expanding. And so from his discoveries, we now know uh, that there is something called the cosmological constant, which is the speed at which the universe is expanding uh, in that sense. The actual uh, fabric, so to say, of the universe is expanding away. The typical way to understand this is, is imagining if you had, let's say, a uh, balloon. And on your balloon that you were blowing up, it was deflated, but you're blowing it up, there's little buttons glued to the outside of the uh, the surface of that balloon. And as you then begin to inflate it, the fabric itself is stretching, and so the buttons themselves become farther and farther away from each other. That, in a sense, is what is happening to the galaxies uh, that are within our universe. And so the expansion of the universe discovered in 1929 by Edwin Hubble at the Mount Wilson Observatory is, again, very powerful evidence of the truth of premise two, that the universe indeed had a beginning. Why is that so? Because if the universe is expanding away from a point of apparent origin, if, let's say, like a movie projector, if you rewind it backwards more and more and more and more, as a film running backwards, eventually all of the, the time and space and matter and energy would eventually condense down into a point, scientists say, of, quote, infinite density and dimensionless space. And that's scientific jargon for nothingness. There actually comes a point, and again, this is in line with the Big Bang Theory, where it actually goes down into this extremely tiny uh, mathematical point of infinite density and dimensionless space, and then nothingness. So again, it is, it is more scientific confirmation, observation, and proof that the universe came into being out of nothingness and is, has been expanding away from this apparent point of origin even still today, we see this happening. So again, the E in fresh is for the expansion of the universe, established by Edwin Hubble, 1929. And today, there's the cosmological constant, which is the actual speed of that expansion rate of the universe. Powerful scientific evidence in support of a Christian worldview that the universe indeed had a beginning. F is for famous equation, R is for ripples of heat, discovered in 1989. Expansion of the universe, discovered in 1929. And S is for second law. Uh, in other words, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, for those of you who are scientifically knowledgeable, this is also known as entropy. And this is basically the statement that every, every system of energy is losing its ability to perform useful work. Uh, another way to phrase it commonly is that every, every state of Every system is going from a state of high order to disorder, from a state of organization to disorganization, uh, from a state of uh, high energy to low energy. Uh, so basically, it's just the running down of the universe. People compare it, for example, to a clock having been wound up, and now the clock is winding down, and eventually um, the universe will, will die of a heat death um, and Entropy is where a system loses the ability to perform um, useful work, basically. It's this law of cosmic deterioration that we see at work within the universe. This is such a fundamental established law, not only of thermodynamics, 
but also of just science in general, that virtually no work is being done in this area of science. It's what they call kind of a closed area of science because it's, it's so uh, verifiably true and it's been tested so many times, it's accepted as scientific law and fact about reality. So this is why it's called the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so entropy. Again, how, how does this support the truth of premise two? Well, if everything is now winding down to a state of disorder, of coldness, of not having this ability to perform useful uh, work, and etc., well, if that's progressing over time, right, and this is an established feature of the known cosmos, if we have been here for an infinite amount of time, what would have already happened? If the universe would have already been infinitely old, if we would have been here for an infinite amount of time, what kind of a state or condition would the universe presently be in? Heat death. Entropy would be at a maximum, but it's not. It's still running down. And so what does that tell us? That we haven't been here for an infinite amount of time, because if we had been, the universe would already be at a maximum state of entropy. So again, this is a well-established area of scientific law, and it points again to the truth of that second premise that the universe had a beginning. Again, F is for famous equation, e equals mc squared, 1916. R is for ripples of heat, 1989, the $200 million COBE satellite. E is for expansion of the universe, 1929, Edwin Hubble, the Mount Wilson Observatory. S is for the second law, an established scientific law of entropy. And then the H is for heat radiation, heat radiation afterglow. This is referring back to 1965 when two scientists, uh, due to pigeons, bird droppings, and an accident, discovered something fascinating about the universe. Let me tell you the story. In 1965, two Bell Lab scientists, Arnold Penzias and Robert Wilson, at the Bell Labs in New Jersey, were uh, taking some interesting readings about the universe and heat and etc. right with their radar dishes angled towards the sky they got some interesting readings on their dishes as if they could perceive through their instruments at bell lab uh, this this afterglow heat radiation kind of the remnant heat from this this explosion or cosmic creation event from the beginning but they, they didn't believe that they thought there must be some malfunction and so uh, they, they thought it might be bird droppings from pigeons and so they ordered technicians to go out there and clean it all up but sure enough, you know, accidentally through these this weird circumstances of events, because they did actually, uh, at some point in the story, have some interesting run-ins with pigeons and 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 these kinds of uh, situations. They did actually accidentally discover that their instruments were correct, and they accidentally discovered in 1965 that we can in fact measure and see you can find these pictures all over the internet on NASA from Bell Labs etc that there is indeed a heat radiation afterglow from that beginning quote unquote explosion or this cosmic creation event of the universe and we can still see that the minor but there are differences in temperature actually in line with what the big the big bang theory predicted so again that this is another uh, piece of the puzzle that we would expect to find if indeed the universe had a beginning a finite time ago in this in this this violent or or sudden you know creation event or explosion out of nothingness these are different scientific elements of that theory that we would expect to find and in fact we do find them so uh, that's it for today i do hope that these five lines of scientific evidence can really help you out the F is for the famous equation, and 1916 discovered by Albert Einstein, E equals mc squared, shows that um, the universe had a definite point of beginning. The R is for ripples of heat. 1989, the $200 million COBE satellite, again, uh, discovering these ripples of heat and matter throughout the universe. It was like looking at the fingerprints of God, the machining marks of the maker himself. E in fresh is for the expansion of the universe. 1929, Edwin Hubble, Discover that at the Mount Wilson Observatory. S is for the second law of thermodynamics, also known as entropy, that the universe is running down and therefore couldn't have been here an infinite amount of time. 
And the H is for the heat radiation afterglow of the universe, discovered on accident 1965 by Arnold Penzias and Robert Wilson at the Bell Labs in New Jersey. Taken all together, this should give you a fresh perspective about the universe that not just philosophically, but scientifically, we can demonstrate with the... Uh, it's almost like a religion today with the scientific reasonings and good scientific observations and evidence that the universe did indeed have a beginning. And so if that second premise is true, and it does seem to be so philosophically and scientifically, if it is true that premise number one, that everything that begins to exist has a cause, and if we are within our rights believing premise number two, the universe began to exist, and we can believe that because of reasons philosophical and reasons scientific, then what follows logically and inescapably? The conclusion, therefore, the universe has a cause. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Now let me just ask you a question as we, cl as we close. If there was a cause behind the universe, what kind of a thing or a being would it have to be? Well, let me just throw out some suggestions for you and see if any of these characteristics or attributes match up with the theistic God, the creator God of the Christian worldview. To be the creator of the universe, in other words, the creator of time, you'd have to be what? Outside of time. To be the creator of all of space and, and material, you would have to be immaterial and outside of space. To be the creator of all matter and energy, this would have to be a tremendously, some might say, all-powerful being. To be the person who is responsible for all of the design structure, which we'll get into in another argument, but if you wanted to throw that into it, you'd have to be an incredibly intelligent, some might say, all-knowing cause. And then, of course, to go from a state of affairs where there was no universe to a state of affairs where there was a universe, there would have to be in there at some point a decision, a choice. And this, of course, comes only from a mind. So not only have we seemed to arrive at the conclusion that it's reasonable for a personal theistic God to exist, but also we've arrived at the conclusion that many of the attributes that we just arrive at logically by examining this cause behind the universe, what types of attributes or characteristics would, would it have to have? It also happens to be the same characteristics that we do find, many of them, in the theistic God of Scripture. And it would then point to the fact that they would have to be one and the same. So this is interesting. A timeless, immaterial, all-powerful, incredibly intelligent, personal creator of the universe itself. And that is the ultimate conclusion that we arrive at logically and inescapably from those two premises of the Kalam cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Well, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And it is the type of cause that does seem to match up with this, this personality profile, the being of uh, the theistic God of the Christian worldview. Fascinating stuff. So I do encourage you to um, look at your notes if you took any. Um, go through the video again. Think about this stuff. Pray about it. And especially if you're an agnostic or an atheist, I do encourage you. Examine your beliefs. I did this for two years. This is why I have become a Christian, and I, I wholeheartedly follow the Christian worldview because it's the most livable and it's the most logical worldview and philosophy that there is. Not only because it matches up with what I know to be true about reality philosophically, but also what I observe to be true about reality scientifically. It feels good having a worldview, a philosophy, a way of looking at life, that makes sense in both of these areas, I can walk out my door and what I expect to discover is actually what exists in reality. And it matches up. I don't have to leave my worldview at home and uh, change my behavior, change my perspective uh, throughout the day. I can hold to my worldview because it's consistent and it matches up with what I see in the world around me. So I encourage you guys to go over the information, pass this on to some of your friends, 
Uh, and until next time, have an intelligent faith.